Yeah, thanks a lot for, for having me. Thanks a lot for inviting me, for bringing me over and for giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about um, my research. Um, I acknowledge that this is probably a little bit of an unusual talk because I think I received an email in which I was asked to provide a summary of my dissertation, which basically means that I tried to cram in three papers of mine into the next 90 minutes, but we can just see how far we get. And my, maybe we're going to stop it after two. But let's see how it goes and how interactive the seminar is going to be. I think in general, um, the motivation for my research can be very nicely illustrated by looking at this graph. So what I brought you here are the results from a recent Gallup World Poll where representative samples in different countries across the globe have been asked to what extent they agree with the statement that inequality between rich and poor is unfair. And what we see here is really that a large share of the world population agrees with the statement that inequality uh, between rich and uh, poor is something that they consider unfair. So on one side of the spectrum, you have countries like Afghanistan, Egypt, Jordan, where ev almost everyone thinks that inequality is something that is of concern from a fairness perspective. On the other side of the spectrum, you have countries like Jap Japan, Indonesia, Czech Republic, where uh, roughly 30 to 40 percent of the people still think that inequality is something that is unfair. In the middle, you have a bunch of other countries, among others the United States, and Germany, the country that I am from, where roughly 60% of the people th uh, think that uh, inequality between rich and poor is uh, something that is unfair. Now, this descriptive evidence, of course, raises a couple of follow-up questions, namely, what do people mean when they say something is unfair? How can we, what can we actually do in order to kind of like move the distribution of resources that we have in society so, uh, somewhat closer to something that uh, people would consider to be uh, fair? And what can um, academic research actually do in order to also equip policymakers to make the desired changes? And these are kind of like the questions that my overall research agenda uh, revolves around. And I like to think about my research agenda kind of like along the lines of an ideal type five-step process. So on the one hand, we of course want to understand what is the normative principle that people have in mind when they say something is unfair. So what is, what is actually the fairness conception that they have here in mind when they uh, basically make their normative evaluations. Once we know that, of course, we might want to formulate measures that capture the extent to which the current distribution of resources diverges from this bliss distribution that basically characterizes a fair distribution from the perspective of, or from the normative um, 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 viewpoint um, that people invoke when making their fairness judgments. Once we have a measure, we might also want to estimate those measures in a way that it makes sense from a statistical perspective, such that we basically have measures that we can also um, give to policymakers, telling them how far we are actually away from this bliss point. But we should not stop there, of course. In the end, it also comes down to kind of like identifying causal drivers for the existence of the current distribution of resources and potential res uh, policy responses that could actually address the apparent gap between what would be considered to be a fair distribution or in the current distribution of resources. Now, what I want to talk about today are kind of like the three central elements of this uh, research agenda, which are basically the three chapters of my dissertation. And what I want to start with is not this graph, but the first paper, um, which actually has the title, uh, Measuring Unfair Inequality, Reconciling Equality of Opportunity and Freedom from Poverty. And this is joint work with Ravi from Cornell and Andreas from, uh, from, uh, from Munich. And this paper basically started off with a very simple observation, namely that we all know how to measure inequality. We all know how to construct a Gini coefficient, how to measure the top 10% uh, percent income share, or maybe also the mean log deviation. But there seems to be an apparent tension between the, measure, uh, the, the way that we currently measure inequality and the fairness principles that people invoke when making ju normative judgments about the current uh, distribution of resources. So what we know is basically that when people think about fairness in society, they not necessarily think that a perfectly equal distribution of resources is a fair distribution, but they care about the reasons for why inequality comes about. They care about the structure of inequality that maybe the rich have too much or the poor have too little, which basically then informs their judgment of whether there is actually something of a normative concern in the current distribution of resources. And what we do now in this paper is that we want to construct an inequality measure that actually respects the, uh, the, the fairness principle that we see are prevalent in the, uh, in the population. 
So it means basically we go out into the literature and philosophy to see kind of like how philosophers think about fairness. And we also go to the literature in uh, behavioral economics to see what are the distributional principles that people are invoking when thinking about fairness and construct basically a measure of unfairness that pays respect to those fairness principles. And those two fa fairness principles that we invoke is by now probably not surprising, equality of opportunity and freedom from poverty. So that's kind of like the theoretical part of the paper where we kind of like construct this measure. But then we also um, take this measure to the data and reassess inequality trends in the US from a fairness perspective and also make um, cross-country comparisons uh, uh, with respect to unfair inequality across countries and see to, to what extent the conclusions that we draw are different from the conclusions that you would draw if you were basically just using a standard inequality measure. So what are the core principles that we invoke? Before you go too far, yes. I mean, I know that in your work, we circulated your thesis, so yeah. people had a chance to look at it. I don't know if you have to get it line by line. Yeah. People look. But the question is, what's the dimension you're really into? I mean, is, is it income? Is it income at a point in time? Is it life cycle income? Is it health? Yeah. Uh, it is a more general notion of inequality of, of some life outcomes, utility, or is it really it seems to me you were focusing a lot on the in inequality in income at the yes. same time. Yes. Which I know is the traditional measure, Atkins said and so mm -hmm. But is, is that really the right measure? I mean, the reason was, you know, there's this old paper you probably know by Flint, yeah. for example, about Italy, where he actually looks at the, uh, the mobility or the life cycle. Yeah. So at a point in time, people, there's a lot of inequality. But if you look at the job search model that he fits, you find a lot of people moving in and out of these states. And so that's a question. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a real question about what, I mean, isn't there even a prior question to what you're doing, which is to ask what is it we should be measuring? Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, uh, the point is completely well taken. I think here we are a little bit, I mean, in terms of the empirics, what we do, we focus on snapshot income within a particular year. However, there's, of course, a bigger normative question, what do we actually care about when we're talking about inequality? And I completely agree. Probably we might also care about um, lifetime, uh, lifetime income as such, consumption possibilities. We might also care about health. In principle, the machinery that we're setting up here is kind of like could accommodate those different outcome dimensions that, uh, that, that were basically just mentioned. However, what we're doing here in, uh, precisely in this paper is actually that we look at snapshot um, income, which of course is important for people, especially if we think about like what determines my consumption in a particular year, it's probably the income that I'm earning in this particular year. So I think there's a rationale to look at this particular outcome dimension and why it is actually of normative importance. Yeah, but I mean, just for example, mm -hmm. I, mean, yeah, I don't want to slow you down too much, but you know, if graduate students are not earning much income, and then later there will be, you know, making huge sums of money as, uh, say, surgeons or lawyers or whatever, yeah. uh, then we don't really worry much about that, do we? No, I mean, graduate students might right now. <laughs> yes, yeah. But that even they would recognize they're going to do much better on the yeah. road. So. No, I, I, as I said, I think like there are rationales for both, both looking at um, uh, different dimensions here. I think, of course, I mean, we might not uh, worry about particular factions of the, of the population right now in terms of the income that they have because they're going to have more uh, in the long run. However, in this particular year, we still care that they might have enough to make ends meet, right? So there is also a normative rationale to care about the incomes. We cannot even out everything across the entire life cycle. I understand that that's like saying getting people above the social minimum. Yeah. I but mean, you want them to be at least able to survive. Exactly. But that is something that is, for example, reflected here, right? Yeah. No, I understand. Yeah. But that's the, but that you would accept, even the starving graduate students would get fed. But Okay, go ahead. I mean, I think it's a. I no, think I think. It's useful I, to clarify this. Yeah, yeah, no. So I think, like, in principle, we can look at lifetime income, at health, or whatever, from a, a, with the machinery that we're setting up here. When it comes to the empirical implementation, we look at um, um, snapshot income. There is a normative rationale for, uh, for doing that, but that doesn't preclude that it's the only thing one might want to look at. I think that is my, that is my stance here. Yeah. So the reason why I'm saying all this is that it really reflects the nature of. A lot of the very last part of your diagram, the one you're not going to talk about, yeah. what we do for policy. Yeah. Because if a lot of it is just redistribution of income over time, for example, yeah. then you might look at credit markets and look at things like uh, instruments and borrowing and 
lending against that. Right? Yeah. And that's kind of off the table if you're looking at mostly the survival exactly. period by period. Yeah. So that's why I'm, I'd be curious. Maybe we'll get to that. Later. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Let, let me move on a little bit and then we might be able to take it up uh, um, as we go along. So, so I, I have another question oh, back to the earlier, to the slide just before. So, uh, fairness principles, equality of opportunity, and freedom from poverty, and mm -hmm. those two are things that we think are important. But something that seems to be motivating a lot of discussions of, about inequality are, um, you know, concerns about the top 1% or top. 0.1%, mm -hmm. which don't seem to be either a quality of opportunity or freedom from poverty, yeah. but more, um, yeah. I don't know, kind of uh, envy or something. Yeah. No, uh, I completely agree. So in principle, you can think about like another kind of extend, extending this list of normative requirements. Um, so the way we're going to do this is actually very flexible and also allows us to ac accommodate more um, uh, principles that go in the, that direction. So I think like in an earlier version of this paper, we also had a third requirement here, which we called freedom from affluence, which also basically was more going uh, in the direction of um, how much or how much is basically too much uh, in, in the upper tail of the income distribution. But your answer to both my question and Jim's question is that you're providing, with, with this, let me put words into your mouth, would be like to say that I, what I'm doing is providing a general framework which, is, and I'm using the example of looking at exactly. income in a year, I'm looking at these two. Exactly. Framework. Exactly. I mean, not, I think like it might be an answer to your question, but one thing that I might want to also add to your question, at least if you look into the literature and philosophy, how much is too much, is an answer that people are really struggling with. So there's not as much of a normative cons consensus as, uh, as, uh, as regarding those two principles, why we are, uh, th and this basically provides the reason why we're looking especially on those two while taking this affluence thing off the table for the moment. But in principle, if it turns out in the future that basically we have a consensus on how much is too much or that really there's a strong normative concern about um, um, the upper tail there, then in principle we can also extend this work in this direction. Okay. Um, equality of opportunity. Um, I think in principle um, um, what equality of opportunity basically means is, or what opportunity egalitarians do, is that they um, basically uh, think about two sources of, or two potential sources of inequalities. On the one hand, there are so-called circumstances, so there are factors beyond my individual control that ha might have an influence on my life outcomes. Here you can think about your biological sex, maybe your skin color, maybe the socioeconomic status of your parents and so forth. And opportunity egalitarians basically think that these factors beyond your individual control are, your, um, are leading to unfair inequalities. The second element that they want to think about are efforts. So those are especially things that are partially at least under your control. Um, um, so here, can, you can, here you can think about your life decisions in terms of how much to work, how hard to work, how concentrated to work, maybe also enrolling in an additional education program and so forth. And those efforts are basically considered to be fair sources of inequality from an opportunity egalitarian perspective. And as I said... There's like a time dimension missing, right? You'd say, that is beyond. So there may be some issue that I can't control this minute. Mm -hmm. But if I develop a skill or I move to another place, I can't control it. And so it moves, one moves into two pretty easily, especially if, there's a, if I can have some choice in, 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 the, in arranging those factors, right? So what would be an example for that, that you con oh, can control the circumstances? Well, that's a dangerous area. Mm -hmm. And so uh, right now, I rent but, an apartment and but then it's gun, but then like, of gun violence, but then next week I get a new apartment. But I, think, but I think an opportunity egalitarian would say, this is an effort. If you have control about choosing where to live, and you can uh, basically avoid or uh, the gamble in terms of living in a da dangerous area, then this, this is basically your choice that you well, live in this area. If somebody's putting a gun to my head, then it's not really much I but, can control. But well, I can't but, make sure that but I think are not there anymore. At least the risk of getting uh, um, 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 a gun against your head that is determined by your choice that, uh, in, in terms of living there, that is something that is under your control and that would go into the effort camp. Yeah, but think about somebody smoking. This thing can't lung cancer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I find at some age I have terminal lung cancer. 
and that's beyond my control. Mm -hmm. I'd love to be able to get rid of it, but I can't stay. But 20 years ago, I could have prevented myself from that. So where, yeah. how, do you, how, how does that work in this team? Yeah, absolutely. But again, I think like from a crude opportunity egalitarian perspective, they would say this is an effort. It's your choice to smoke. You basically, you're, you know what the outcome of that is. And if you then are facing this outcome, that is basically an inequality that you just have to uh, come to terms with by yourself because... Even if it was a choice you made 20 years ago. Even if that is a choice you made 20 years ago. But then in some sense, you know, look, look, go to the Ukraine. People are now getting shelled by the uh, Russians. They could have chosen to live in Azerbaijan or yeah. move to Turkey. So which, where would you put the Ukrainians? Okay. Too. So okay, let me let me kind of like draw a line here in terms of the discussion, and yeah, well, I mean, and I because like because boundary question about what exactly. And so I don't, I think you probably research this and you're going to tell us more about it. But it seems like it's a huge issue about what factors that you control. Absolutely. And, but uh, and and when I can control it, and what's the best way to control it, right? I think like. Um, from my perspective, I think like, I mean, this is basically just a characterization of the existing literature of what people mean when they speak about inequality of opportunity. In my perspective, and we're, we're adopting this uh, terminology here. From my perspective, the um, state or kind of like the, the, the labeling in, ter in terms of circumstances and efforts might be misleading. What I think is much more useful to think about is what are kind of like characteristics or life factors that we do want to compensate people for and what are things we want to hold them responsible for? And I think then we do not have to kind of like get into the nitty gritty questions of what do we have control over at a particular point of time, but we can have the discussion about living in Ukraine or not Ukraine, smoking 20 years ago, or the neighborhood that I live in, in terms of something, do we want to compensate for the choices that people have made in this particular situation? And I think like if we generalize this idea of circumstances and efforts along these lines, we don't, do not have to go through every kind of like nitty gritty detail, uh, not uh, example that would and could come up with. You have to assess things like genetics and things yeah, that are really exact. truly beyond your control, right? Yeah, exactly. But again, I mean, that there are people out there who would say like, even though genetics are not, beyond your, uh, are not within your control, we do not want to compensate people for differential genetic endowments because this is kind of like their self-ownership. So again, I mean, there, there are different normative stands here, and I think the important conversation to have is what do we want to compensate people for? And this is like a normative discussion, and that might not be necessarily tied to what do we have control over or not. However, opportunity egalitarians draw the line exactly at the, at the distinction what is, can be controlled and what not. But there is a very large literature that's doing exactly one and two, right? Wrong, you mentioned wrong. Yeah, 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 no, no, exactly. I mean, this is just for illustrating one of the normative principles that we're go going to invoke. Okay. This is not, this is not something yeah, we have come up here. Really it is, it is fuzzy, absolutely. But it is, I mean, I cannot see a world where it's not fuzzy. <laughs> well, no, I mean, genetic factors, I think, seem to be pretty clear. I mean, you don't control your genes. The individual never controls their genes. That you is true. Gene splicing, I guess. Right. right. Now, no, but I think. And have some kind of, uh, no, I think like genetic the, transformations, I suppose. But now. Yeah, but the question is still do we want to compensate people for genetic endowments? And I think that is the fuzzy issue. issue. But on what basis do I answer that question? Huh? On what basis can I even answer that question? That this is something that we as a society can decide whether we want to do that or not. Yeah. This, well, this how is what. How do we make those decisions, though? I'm not talking about legislation. <laughs> On what principles would I make an argument one way or the other? I mean, from my perspective, and I think that is something also Roma would agree with, it comes down to a political consensus, right? What are those factors that we want to compensate people for? And it's in a, in a way, it's kind of like a democratic decision of how we want to tailor kind of like also our compensation system. To what extent are they actually responsive to those different factors that are in life that people have or do not have control over? So the same set of conditions of I'm living in a totalitarian state or a you know, complete democracy or some kind of libertarian uh, paradise, say, would be three different sets of compensations, uh, three different conditions that you'd want to compensate for, right? Yeah, could be. 
But that's totally then one of the politics that determine the outcome. No, but I mean, I mean, we're still like in the realm of philosophy, like, right? I mean, when we're kind of like... Okay, we can argue with this all day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let me move on, but... No, precisely because we can do it. I just wonder where, where does it become a sharp argument? It, it isn't the same. No, no, exactly. But, I mean... I, at least, I mean, now I'm running ahead a little bit in, the, in, a, in terms of the project that we're doing. But, but I think like the beauty of what we're doing here is that we're actually having those conversations <laughs> in terms of like that it actually gets us going, like how do we actually evaluate inequalities? And we're getting kind of like to the core of what are the normative principles that we're invoking. You're giving me counter examples. I'm giving you, uh, uh, I'm giving you interpretations of what can be done and so forth. But now we get to kind of like to the bottom of what is wrong with inequality. We might not resolve our arguments tonight, but at least we get the conversation going. And I think that is something that we also kind of like have in mind when, when we wrote this paper, that we're making transparent how different normative choices of how we compensate certain um, individual characteristics, how they might influence our normative judgments and how it plays out in our measurement of inequality. Okay? Okay, that is equality of opportunity. Now, a main charge or kind of like a main criticism that... Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I have another question on the Of course, like, how, how do we even measure if something is uh, within your own control? Like, if you struggle to concentrate in the class because of, of some attention deficiency, do you, do you regard that as something beyond your control? But if, if, if the same, like, an, another student also struggles in class but he's not diagnosed or ADHD, then is that low effort or is that... Again, I mean, this is, I think, like, in the, same, in the same vein as the previous discussion, right? I mean, it depends... In the end, um, oops, um, how, do we, um, how, do we, how do we evaluate those different factors from a normative perspective? I think a standard opportunity egalitarian would now give you the answer. If kind of like you're, um, you cannot concentrate in class because, it's, uh, because of a genetic predisposition, at least the extent to which you're not able to focus in class that is caused by this genetic predisposition is something that is worthy of compensation. If you're kind of like deliberately just uh, kind of like a dozing way on Facebook or whatever, then probably this lack of concentration in class is something that goes into the, the effort camp. But as we basically already has, have discussed, kind of like the distinction between Ms. Fuzzy, and we basically will have to draw a line uh, somewhere, but this is basically um, up for normative debate where this line can be drawn. Yeah, but it, it just gets even more complicated because even like diagnosis of, of diseases could be, could be... Absolutely, I acknowledge all of that. So, but this is exactly the point, right? We make this distinction, what do we find worthy of compensation? And we can debate every example basically in the world and how it might be uh, under the control of people or not. But in the end, we will have to make a decision whether we find it worthy of compensation or not. And that is something that is captured here. Okay. Okay, so if that was already complicated for opportunity egalitarians, I think it becomes even more complicated for them. So one main criticism that opportunity egalitarians um, have, to, uh, have to struggle with is the question of whether exposed inequalities are a matter of indifference from a, from a, um, from a, uh, from a normative perspective. What do I mean by exposed inequalities is, bas uh, is basically to what extent do we really evaluate the distribution of outcomes that is only caused due to effort, differential effort, within a certain condition or the circumstances that you're facing, really a matter of indifference. So one very prominent criticism that was put forward by the philosopher Elizabeth Anderson is based on an example, which is the example of the negligent victim. So what she's basically saying is like, listen, consider a, uh, consider a bicycle driver who by choice doesn't purchase insurance, by choice is not wearing a helmet, by choice is driving recklessly, and now has an accident and lies uh, basically um, badly hurt in the ditch. What opportunity egalitarians would tell you was basically, well, this is basically driven by the choices, so there's no need for society to step in and kind of like correct for this, uh, for this outcome. However, the moral intuition of many people would be that, like, listen, this uh, outcome is so dire, we as society, uh, as society have, a, have um, an obligation to help this person from a human humanitarian perspective. And of course, this is kind of like um, something that can also be... Um, um, or this example can also be uh, transferred into income to the domain. So basically what the principle of freedom from poverty says is that, that the le least income that we observe in society has to be 
large enough such that this person who has the least income in society is able to at least make ends meet. So we really want to make sure that nobody um, uh, has a, um, 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 an outcome that is as bad that it doesn't allow this person to make ends meet. And this is basically something that cuts across this is a distinction that we have seen in the case of opportunity egalitarian, so efforts and circumstances. This is really the case that we make a correction for these outcomes regardless of whether it's the result of circumstances or efforts. And again, this is something that is reflected both in the philosophical discourse and also in the distributional uh, uh, preferences of individuals. Blind end is biological or could be socially determined. I think Adam Smith, you know, back mm -hmm. in the theory of moral sentiments, mm -hmm. he was talking about, you know, the, the person who needs to be living at least at the level that's acceptable in that society. Yeah. So if we uh, imagine a society in which, say, everybody is now living in, uh, I don't know, let's say, uh, Brentwood in Los yeah. Angeles, very rich, relatively affluent. So should everybody have a Mercedes? Is white man the Mercedes, or is it a so a, a good mansion, or is it a uh, or is it a tent? Or I mean, so, again, is it biologically determined, and what what is the acceptable yeah. minimum? Again. I mean, here basically we are going again into the normative discussion of what this Y min is exactly. exactly. So we don't take a, again this machinery can employ it to whatever we decide is uh, of why, what what my Y min is. We have basically in the paper we have, when we come to the empirics, we have we talk about um, social uh, socially determined poverty lines basically that are relative, uh, calibrated relative to the medium income in society. We have absolute poverty line that are lines that are calibrated based on uh, a necessary calorie intake to, uh, that is necessary to survive. So again, depending on the normative assumptions that you make with respect to this y min, you will get different empirical results. But nevertheless, it is a, a kind of like the general machinery of how you can measure unfair inequality based on those principles basically stays in place. Does that answer the question? No. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, okay, so maybe more concrete to, uh, concretely to the Brentwood example. I'm just saying, I'm just saying it's again fuzzy, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. So, um, so we have those two normative principles, and the question is, of course, how do we reconcile those normative principles into a joint measure of unfair inequality? And what we use as a, uh, um, as a tool to reconcile those normative principles is that we rely on a so-called norm-based approach to inequality measurement. So what is this norm-based approach to inequality measurement? Can be illustrated very easily based on this graph that we all know. So we have the Lorentz curve and we have the perfect equality line. And the area between the two defines the Gini coefficient. Now, what the norm-based approach to inequality measurement basically says is that this 45 degree line imp uh, implies a benchmark distribution or a norm distribution that is just one among many possible norm distributions. So the perfect equality line can be also replaced by a different bliss distribution that can be informed by the normative principles or by the fairness principles that we invoke. So in a sense, then, if we kind of like construct an alternative norm distribution based on the fairness principles that we have in mind, we can then measure unfair inequality as the difference between um, the empirically observed distribution and the norm or the bliss dis or normative bliss distribution that, if, that, uh, that is informed by the normative principles that we invoke. Now, how do we, so the main challenge basically for us now is to construct a norm distribution that is um, compliant with the two um, um, normative principles that we have in mind. So how do we do that? Well, basically what we're doing is that we're kind of like going through a mental exercise where we say, where we start off with the set of all possible income distributions. And now we subsequently impose restrictions on this full set of income distributions that are consistent with the normative principles that we have in mind. The first principle, of course, that we want to, um, the norm distribution to satisfy is the principle of equality of opportunity. So I don't want you to get necessarily distracted by the math, but uh, because the idea of equality of opportunity is very simple. So what we're invoking here is a so-called ex-ante utilitarian measure of inequality of opportunity. What that basically just means is once we have agreed on the circumstances that we want to uh, compensate for, we just partition the population into types based on those circumstances. And then in an opportunity egalitarian world, there shouldn't be any differences in the average outcomes across those circumstance types. Just to make this more concrete, if you think about a chatty measure of equality uh, of uh, intergenerational mobility, this is exactly what they're doing. They partition the population into types based on parental income ranks. This is the only circumstance that they care about. 
And if the gradient that they calculate then across those average outcomes, um, across those um, uh, children who lived, uh, uh, who grew up with parents of uh, uh, in, the, in different parent, uh, income ranks, is completely flat, they would speak of an equal opportunity society. And this is exactly the same thing that we're doing here. The second principle that we want to invoke is the principle of freedom from poverty. What does freedom from poverty basically just mean, uh, just say? It is basically saying that if we're thinking about a person that has the least in society, this person should have it at least um, the, the poverty threshold that allows her to make ends meet, whatever that poverty threshold is. So if the poverty threshold is having a Mercedes in Brentwood, that could be it, right? It's highly unplausible basically on the, uh, based, on the, uh, based on the normative intuitions that people have. But here at this stage, we still have basically the flexibility in terms of what this Y-min actually means. And the third um, 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 restriction that we impose is basically a principle of reward. The principle of reward is imposed in order to honor income the differences that are the result of differential effort exertion. So what we have in mind here is that if you and I are, uh, have been growing up in the same circumstance type or are from the same circumstance type, and you and I um, are, both have an income above the poverty line, you have an income of 10 above the poverty line, I have an income of five above the poverty line, in the bliss distribution, the relative income dif uh, differences of income that we have in excess of the poverty line have to be respected. So the ratio has to stay two to one. And that basically just ensures that, um, the, that, um, um, the, that uh, the relative income differences that follow from differential effort exertion are to be respected. The nice thing about those three uh, restrictions that are very much in line with the normative principles that we have in mind is that there's only one distribution that is compliant with all of those uh, three uh, principles. So we basically have a bliss distribution, yi star, which um, uh, consists of the following elements. If you are below the poverty line, you get an income that is exactly equal to the poverty line, which is, of course, consistent with the idea of freedom from poverty. If you are above the poverty line um, initially, you're going to get an income that is exactly the poverty line plus something extra. What is this something extra? It's basically determined by two factors. On the one hand, it's uh, determined by yi tilde, which is basically the income that you had in excess of the poverty line, uh, uh, in excess of the poverty line multiplied by a type-specific factor, so a type-specific factor which is conditional on the circumstances that you're facing. If you're basically coming from a type that has, um, that has very advantageous out outcomes on average, this factor is going to be very low. If you're coming from a, a type that had very poor outcomes uh, on average, then this factor is going to be very high, such that we basically incorporate this idea of opportunity equalization across different circumstance types. Of course, like those uh, um, factors are basically just um, a representation of, uh, of, um, um, of more complex mathematical terms, but this way you basically um, see the, uh, the, the, the mechanics of how this, um, uh, the construction of the norm distribution works. So the only restriction on delta is it be members of some kind of ordered set. There's no, there's no cardinality associated with delta per se, right? Uh, order. Yeah, exactly. No, 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 there is cardinality. It is based on the differences in average outcomes across those different types. Average? Yeah. Because that is in line with the idea of opportunity equalization. If you think back, in an opportunity egalitarian world, the average outcomes across types have to be equalized. Ex-ante average or ex post um, no, the average that we see in the actual realization of it, exactly, it's exposed, it's realized. So we now have our norm distribution. We also observe our empirical income distribution. Now we just have to aggregate the divergences. Does that mean, though, that by respect this norm distribution criterion, that I think that it's costless to redistribute? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, no, th just as in any standard measure of inequality, you basically keep the, uh, the, the total amount of resource, resources constant. Exactly. So we now need to aggregate the divergences between our bliss distribution and the empirically observed income distribution, and we do this with a divergence measure, which looks like that. This is basically just a, a generalization of the mean log deviation. So if you would replace yi star here with the average that we see in society, this would measure would collapse exactly to the mean log deviation, which is a standard measure of inequality. 
So when it comes, so what we this is kind of like the, the theoretical part of this paper. There's a lot more in terms of um, 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 kind of like different uh, like toying around with different normative principles in the paper. But I want what I want to show you um, now is kind of like also an empirical implementation of this paper. So what we do in terms of the empirical work is so we use uh, um, we provide basically two empirical applications. On the one hand, um, we provide a reassessment of inequality trends. Um, in, in the US um, based on the PSID and we also match the PSID to a cross-sectional European data set where we have information on 31 European countries and then basically we go back to that measure just for a second though uh, uh, sure. long measure. yeah so uh, what's the rationale when supposing Y is kind of very close to one I mean supposing we have you know, a community in which we have Y all Y's are y, one plus or minus epsilon okay I'm just trying to get a sense of where, um, what this is really, why I should look at this as a good measure. Why is this a good measure, divergence? Um, so what, what, what do you have in mind that all the Y's, or the, y, the YI's or the YI stars? Well, I'm just thinking about expanding the logarithm around the, uh, the log of y log. No, this measure is super sensitive in the bottom of the distribution. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, and there are, so one nice, so basically, why people in inequality measurement like the mean log deviation is that it has like the standard uh, um, 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 uh, properties of an inequality measure, but then it has uh, additionally nice added, um, 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 properties in terms of um, 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 decomposition into the different components um, of the underlying inequality. So this is why you would, they, uh, in this literature, they use the mean log deviation a lot. However, here we're not particularly married to this particular measure, so we also have sensitivity analyses with respect to, um, with respect to other inequality measures, just as the Gini coefficient or um, um, other type measures. So like an entropy measure. So like a tile entropy. This is, a, this is, the, this is an entropy measure with epsilon zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, this is the tile it, index with zero, basically, it, as the alpha it's parameter. That's what I'm saying. That's why I said, yeah. get it you're expanding around a particular point. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. So in terms of data, I told you we use the PSID. We match it with European data for 31 countries. Um, the income concept that we're looking uh, at, basically coming back to our initial discussion, is equivalent disposable household income. So that means basically we look at an income concept after redistribution through existing welfare systems. And we also make an assumption um, based uh, about the re uh, distribution of resources within households. Now, we already had this discussion. So if you want to take this measurement approach to the data, you will have to make choices on what you consider a circumstance. You will have to make choices what you consider not to be circumstances. And you will have to make a choice what you consider to be a relevant pov poverty measure. So here, basically, what we do in our baseline, uh, in our baseline analysis is that we consider those, uh, the, those uh, circumstance characteristics, parental occupation, parental edu education, basically as proxies for, um, for the socioeconomic background characteristics of the household in which a child was growing up, the biological sex, and the race of an individual. In Europe, we're basically not, not looking at racial differences, but um, differences by immigration background, because it's more the more relevant um, circumstance characteristics in Europe. In terms of the poverty measure, what we're looking at is um, a poverty measure, which is an absolute poverty line um, that, uh, that was derived from this paper. Just to give you a ballpark figure, in 2015 US dollars, this is uh, roughly 13,000 US dollars per individual, which is basically the poverty line that we use here. We're going to toy around with all of these assumptions, with normative uh, assumptions of how we operationalize the measures in a, a, a wide set of sensitivity analyses. Um, going the wrong direction. So based on, those, um, um, based on those operationalizations, how does unfair inequality in the US look like? In the red line, this is basically a development that all of you have seen already, probably multiple times. So this is just sketching the development of total inequality in the US based on the mean log deviation. This is family income, or is it? This is, this is uh, household disposable income. Household oh, disposable income. Exactly. Uh, is that including transfers? And yeah. It is after taxes, transfers, and basically a baked in assumption about how resources are shared within the household. Would that be based on what the official census data are, though? I mean, there's this whole discussion, right, about the emission of a lot of transfers. And yeah. 
So we basically, what we do here, I mean, we're working with the PSID and then we're using the um, kind of like the imputation techniques of uh, or developed by Bruce Meyer to kind of like account for the fact that some transfer income might be underreported. So we tried the best that we can in order to take account of the fact that in the PSID, not all of those transfers, uh, transfers are well reported. But nevertheless, there are the usual caveats with respect to the measurement of certain income components in survey data. So it's like CPI new adjusted Yeah. Okay. okay, so up there you see total inequality. Down here you see the development of unfair inequality as, uh, as coming from our measure. Now, there, with, with, with respect to unfair inequality, a couple of things uh, stand out. First of all, of course, unfair inequality is much lower than total inequality. This is by construction because total inequality provides an upper bound for unfair inequality. You cannot construct a norm distribution that is more equal than the perfect equality line. What you also see is that there seems to be an upward, just as for total inequality, there seems to be an upward trajectory of unfair inequality. To see that a little bit better, you can also focus on the uh, gray line here. You see, don't see the confidence intervals, I, I suppose, but there are also confidence intervals. But the black line here is basically giving the ratio between the blue line and, uh, and the red line. So it's the share of total inequality that is in violation of the normative principles that we have invoked. And what you see here is that kind of like you see a slight, kind of like a overall like a stable pattern of total unfair uh, inequality that is roughly around 20% 20, uh, 20 of total inequality in the US. Now, is that good news? Is that bad news? I think it depends a little bit on, your, um, uh, on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. I think if you're an optimist, you're basically saying, listen, total in, uh, unfair inequality is only 20% of total inequality, which is not that bad, and it has been staying constant since 1970, more or less. So that is not too bad. So why is it? So in your figure, you have an alpha equal to zero, but I didn't see an alpha before in the present. Oh, no, this is, OK, so this is the divergence measure. So we said, we said it's a tile index where you have to choose a par parameter alpha. And that's basically make, making it collapse to the generalization of the mean log deviation. Yeah. So, but there's a choice then. Yeah. Right now, this graph is for alpha equal to zero. Exactly. But we, I can show you results also for different choices of alpha. There is nothing changing. <laughs> There's nothing changing in terms of how we rank the different years in terms of the unfair inequality um, uh, characteristics. So I just want to try to understand an intuitive level here. So mm -hmm. I understand the type of measure. But what I'm trying to get at is you have a set of characteristics. And you're going to say those characteristics are basically things outside my control. Mm -hmm. And then the rest you'll say, OK, and that's, that's presumably unfair. Mm -hmm. right? And so though, all those unfairness things. We residualize those, and then your the rest is the fair. Exactly. The residual. Yeah. Exactly. And then you could do this by using a simple regression, right? Just take the total variance of log income, and you could do the same thing. So why you why can, is this better than? That? No, but you can you can do you can do equality of opportunity. You can do based on a simple regression, but you cannot incorporate the freedom from poverty concern in a co-equal fashion. I mean, in principle. Uh, kind of like testing for um, differences or differences in average outcomes across different circumstance types, right. you can just do that from a simple OLS regression that is fully saturated in terms of the circumstances, right, and how they interacted. So in that sense, that is something constructing one counterfactual um, distribution that allows you to the, the extent to which the current distribution of resources diverges from the opportunity egalitarian ideal, that can be done from a regression. How to reconcile that with a second normative concern, then you probably have to go beyond um, a simple regression framework where you ca uh, calculate a counterfactual distribution. But this, when you go back to your formula, this, yeah, the formula, you're going here. Mm -hmm. So what's the role of y min in this dy, this divergence measure? Um, no, in this divergence measure, basically, this is at the individual level. So each individual in society is going to have a bliss income or kind of like a fair income. And this fair income is determined by whether this person is below the poverty line or above the poverty line. If she's above, below the poverty line, she's going to get exactly the poverty line. That is her 
fair income, it's exactly the income that, is, uh, that allows her to make ends meet, if she's above the poverty line or the, in the non-poverty set, she's going to have a more complicated uh, um, um, determination of her fair income, where basically this type consideration also, also comes into play. Yeah, I mean, those are two conceptually different things, though. So you, couldn't you just sort of separate out the line in part? So who, are the, who are the fraction who are really poor? Yeah. The truly poor, and then the rest. And you, then I can I, 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 I add them up this way, or weight them this way, and then there's no particular logic here is there that it says that they must use this wise pi star measure, right? And so you, what you want to do is to calculate a poverty measure and... It would be conditioned on, say, why... So the second component would just simply be the y min plus y bar condition on y tilde i being greater than y min or something. It's a, you know, just two pieces of a distribution. Um, not exactly. So we're getting a little bit more in the, in the weeds of it. So basically what we're doing here in order to construct or kind of like to assign to uh, people to be eligible to, uh, or to be eligible to, uh, to exactly the poverty line or for the other income is basically a two-step process. First of all, we determine kind of like what would be your income looking like in a perfectly opportunity egalitarian society. Basically, we only look at people who are below the poverty threshold once we have corrected for the opportunity disadvantages. And then basically after this step, we're looking at who is now below the poverty line and who deserves to be bumped up. So in that sense, it's not just two pieces of a different distribution, but we really want to make sure that we identify well, those. It isn't here, but I'm wondering, conceptually, isn't that what I'm really interested in though? And namely, how many people are truly poor? And then for the rest, what okay. is the inequality among the non-truly poor? We have, we have a version of this measure that does exactly that. So we separate those two components and look at two separate parts of the distribution. I can show you the sensitivity analysis with respect to that. I think, I mean, there are different pros and cons, so I think it makes sense. I mean, here you're basically, if you separate... Policies. I mean, if a bunch of people are starving to death and you give them food, then that's, but that's but the, the first one based so, on why men, and then the so, rest is... Uh, so the, taxes, transfers. So I think like um, the disadvantage to doing that is that, so imagine that dire poverty perfectly coincides with um, having less um, uh, opportunities in life. If you would separate those two normative conceptions from each other, you would basically say that those people who are below the poverty line can at most hope for getting exactly the poverty line. So this would basically where the transfers kick in. However, Basically, them having such a dire outcome is entirely driven by the circumstances that they're facing or by the opportunity disadvantages. I can say they're all below the poverty yeah. line. I can decide wherever I want to put them yeah. above the poverty line. I don't, I don't have to put them at the poverty line. I mean, so, but where would you put them, like based on the normative rationale? Oh, that's your question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But here we're having an answer to this question, right? We're saying like... I don't know if I accept... I'm not sure. Oh, Tom likes the answer, so... <laughs> no, I don't... <laughs> no, but I mean, honestly, it just seems somewhat arbitrary. I'm just trying to separate it into a logical, philosophical principle. Um, but I understand you put these two things together, and it seems like they're pretty different points. No, but I mean. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure. I mean, you want to kind of like put them together to get in, to, a, to an overall assessment of what is considered to be unfair, right? So, I mean, in that sense, you have to come to terms in terms uh, to, with the question of how you put them together. And there are different ways of doing that. And as we have just discussed, there are different advantages that have, but that they also have different normative implications. You're putting together two conceptually different things. You're talking about how, how different people are if they're above a minimum. Uh, the people at a minimum are different cases. These are the extreme poor, and they require social. Everybody believes, like you said, that we want we don't want people to starve to death. Mm -hmm. They don't want to walk over bodies on the street. Mm -hmm. So once we get above that level, then there's another separate question. So everybody gets the social minimum, and then I don't know which is the best way to think about it from a normative perspective, right? We, uh, we feed them, we keep them alive, nobody dies, we try to avoid death. Exactly. But above that, then everything goes, right? 
Not sure, because people are telling us that like even beyond just the concern of feeding everyone, we have additional normative concerns, which is, for example, the equal opportunity concern. That means above the poverty line, it's not anything goes. People have um, preferences for that, and there are normative principles that apply also to the distribution oh, above. Those are like a different argument, though. We want people to be but it, they're not different arguments if we want to kind of like apply those arguments to a joint evaluation of the current distribution of resources. Then we have to bring those arguments to the table at once. Well, I think that's a vector criterion. That's all I'm saying. I mean, utility comes from those two arguments. How unequal it is, given that I kept people alive. So everybody in Ukraine survives. And then how do we get the wheat and, and, and electricity and everything else. So. You're objecting to putting them both into, the, or making yeah. a single index out of Yeah, exactly. Separate. What's the logic of a single index? I mean, there's this whole literature, as you know, on multidimensional poverty. Yeah, sure, sure. Foster and mm -hmm. all these other people. So I just wonder what the logic, why do you need to put them together? I understand you have one. But I mean, in the end, I mean, when it comes to the uh, evaluation, I mean, uh, of t I mean, poverty is basically one element of inequality, right? And if you're basically facing the decision, so how, what, what am I now doing? Kind of like I have a poverty measure. I have, I have kind of like a measure for equality of opportunity. Which of the two objectives should I now pursue? You need to bring those things together as long as they're reflected in the fairness concerns of individuals. But it's almost in this notion here, the one in and almost as a lexically rapid border, that everybody would say nobody should die. I think that would be the consensus in most societies to keep people alive. And so it's lexical. In that sense, then, you wouldn't have a well-defined preference function. You really have a problem. Just go back to Debrou. You, know, mm -hmm. you, don't, you can't construct the utility function when it's lexical preference. But I think people might think why men is lexical, right? That literally it's, everybody thinks nobody should die if you can avoid I mean, uh, I mean, I think it's an interesting question. Which of the two principles are people assigning priority to. But I'm not sure, I mean, I, like intuitively? This may, I mean, again, from a purely, yeah. you know, I mean, this is my opinion, I agree, mm -hmm. but it, somehow it just seems fundamentally different to say to keep people alive, keep people functioning, as opposed to redistributing goods given they're all alive. So yeah. I, I don't know why one is a better principle to think of than the other. Um, I understand your divergence measure, but I don't understand why it's why it's a dominant notion. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, I would agree like that also from my normative perspective, there is a strong kind of like prior of keeping people alive. So maybe giving a precedence to the to the to the idea of um, freedom of poverty over the op uh, equality of opportunity yeah, concern. Yes, this, this sequential procedure, right? A lexical, I would say, OK, you keep them all alive then. Sure, but I mean, uh, as I, as I said, I mean, we can divorce those concepts uh, completely from each other and treat them as independent uh, um, uh, concepts and still apply this machinery in terms of uh, coming to an overall uh, evaluation of unfair inequality to the extent that there's a violation of either of the two. We don't need to have those principles have to interact with each other. We can nevertheless take kind of like our concern or the concern that you are having uh, with respect to putting the lives of people first and still apply the opportunity egalitarian equalization concern and still have them into a joint measure. Yeah, but if you have this joint measure, then you might end up with situations where some people are dying, right? Because I want to trade off the equal opportunity component and then I have a bunch of people who might be below the line in. And I think that would not be ethically so, so what? Sorry, but he okay. wants to put them into a bit. So you're going to allow there to be a trade-off between keeping people alive and distributing income among those who are alive. Let, let me ask you a question. It, you're saying that that measure there is kind of a weighting of these two measures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, you want, and you want to bring so, them out. And, and, and higher weighting to the public. I want to assign an ethical priority to keep right, them right, alive. Right, right, right. Break them out, show them separately, and put a different uh, weighting. And, Prime, you know, Not separately, but sequential. Sequential, yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that is something that can be done. We haven't done it here, but the, the most that we have uh, done is basically the regular analysis. Then. Sorry? So a, after you say, I like to keep people alive, then I, all I'm saying is you have some very odd ethical properties in this index, right? And you can allow a few people to die. Let's suppose why man means death. Mm -hmm. So some people get to die, but meanwhile, the rest of these people are satisfying equality of opportunity. 
I don't know how many people would accept that. Ex ante. Here, I am. You feel like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I completely agree. I mean, one, one, I mean, what the most that we can do kind of like with this machinery is to kind of like um, separate them completely, but we cannot assign different weightings to them. What should take precedence in, uh, in case that they're in conflict. And exactly. And I completely agree with that. That is something that is not feasible with the machinery that we're setting up here. Yeah, but I just wonder why. From an ethical standpoint, it seems straight. That's okay. Maybe you can take a poll. <laughs> Yeah, one could, <laughs> but uh, so far, <laughs> but so far, I mean, at least um, looking at the literature, and here we're basically operating on the basis of the literature of what we know in philosophy and in the distributional preferences of people. There is no striking evidence that either of the two should take precedence. Although I would agree with you that from my moral standpoint, keeping people alive is certainly more important than um, opportunity right. equalization. Keeping people alive is in the sense of Adam Smith, you know, making sure they have a lot of good coat, and shoes, and car, and television set. Then it wouldn't trade them. So that's when we get back to the definition of what it Yeah, exactly. But here we have complete flexibility. Like you can say this, uh, this, this Y min could be five, or it could be five, yeah. Um, no, we're moving in the wrong direction. So this is kind of like what we find where in the case of uh, the US. Um, is this bad or good news? Um, as I said, like if you're an optimist, this is not so, uh, n not so bad news. But on the other hand, if you're a pessimist, you could also say that, listen, we have seen those very pronounced increase in inequality over time. This increase in inequality has been matched by increases in unfair inequality as well, which, we buy, uh, which is why we have kind of like this constant, um, um, this, uh, this constant um, share of the unfair inequality. And of course, it basically gives rise to why people are concerned about, uh, from a normative perspective, um, about this uh, increase in total inequality. On the other hand, a pessimist could also point out to the fact that what we're looking here, uh, uh, what we're looking at here is unfair inequality after the distribution of existing um, uh, welfare state systems. So in that sense, if you think about 20% per percent of redistribution after all, the, um, uh, after all the taxes and transfers that are currently in place, it's nevertheless still a strong divergence from what people would consider to be a fair distribution of resources. But I believe that uh, up to you whether this is good news or bad news. What I want to show you is also kind of like what is driving those increases in unfair inequality that we have detected. So what we provide here is a decomposition of this blue line that you have seen previously in terms of the development of unfair inequality into the different components, so in the poverty component, and then the different circumstance components that underpin the notion of inequality of opportunity that we invoke. Now what you see here is basically that the contribution of poverty is more or less constant um, over time. That's the component of why greater than why men. Yeah. Less than why. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You also see that the uh, influence of biological sex is not overwhelmingly large. Why is that the case? It's in part by construction, because we're looking at disposable household income, which basically means that everything that we detect in terms of biological sex is driven by the income differences across single households. You also see that the contribution of race is not changing very much over time, which is consistent with the existing literature that tells us that gaps in between the races in the US have been staying um, roughly constant since the, uh, since, the end, uh, since the end of the 1960s. What we see, however, are that the contribution of the education of your parents and the occupational status of your parents has, have been increasing over time. So if you kind of like want to buy into the normative assumptions that, you, that, that we make, you would come to the conclusion basically that uh, the increases in unfair inequality um, that we have seen in the US are especially driven by decreases in social mobility or by the increasing importance of the social background characteristics of the household in which you have been growing up. It's somewhat unusual to separate out occupation from education, isn't it? I mean, given that usually occupation is heavily education. That is, that is true, but I mean, in view of the sample size, we have to construct those, uh, those occupation categories and the education categories very coarsely such that the overlap among them is not like, I mean, it's not like a one-to-one -one mapping. Okay, so 
as we have, uh, as I have said earlier, so what we the way how we like to think about uh, this measure is kind of like a blueprint of how we can measure unfair inequality. But then, in the end, if you want to take this measure to the uh, to the data, you will have to make uh, different assumptions about what it means to be poor. So, what is exactly the y min that we're talking about? What are the circumstance variables that are actually worthy of compensation? Um, how should we actually treat? And uh, going back to our initial um, discussion the correlation between effort and circumstance, and also different divergence measures. So should we actually set the alpha to zero? Should we set the alpha to one? So those are kind of like the empirical choices that you will have to make um, in order to um, um, kind of like come to a scalar measure of unfair inequality. And we provide basically um, uh, um, 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 a wide uh, array of different sensitivity analysis with respect to alternative um, um, normative choices here. So um, let me just check the time. OK, we have 25 minutes. So in terms of the takeaway, so what we do in this paper is that we reconcile the principles of equality of opportunity and freedom from poverty into a joint measure of unfairness. And this measurement approach can be readily extend, extended to other principles of fairness, so going back to the concern for the incomes at the very top. And then what we show in terms of the empirical analysis is that we provide a normative rationale for why people could be concerned about uh, inequality because unfairness in the end traces the development of total inequality in the US and those increases in unfairness are especially driven by um, de decreasing uh, social mobility across generations. Okay, so this is paper number one. I certainly won't make it to a paper number three. <laughs> the question is like, uh, um, uh, which other paper should I talk about? Um, so we have one paper which is also about measurement and one that is more about causal driver. So I can put it to a poll here. <laughs> Any intuitions? It seems it's not <coughs> yeah. Number three? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what we, let's see whether I can cram it into 25 minutes. So what I want to do uh, kind of like in this uh, uh, number three, uh, the third paper is to think about how those differences across uh, different groups in the population actually translate into intergenerational um, disadvantages or dis 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 uh, not disadvantages, but intergenerational transmission mechanisms. And what I want to talk about especially is um, a paper that is titled The Parental Wage Gap and Development of Socio-Emotional Skills in Children. And as you can infer from this title, there are two core elements that I want to think about in this paper. First is there's the parental wage gap. What do I mean by the parental wage gap? Um, the parental wage gap is essentially capturing the, the, the wages that are available to mothers and fathers in the labor market. So another way of thinking about the parental wage gap is along the lines of an intra-household gender wage gap. And if you think about it along those lines, then of course it doesn't come as a big surprise that this statistic has seen massive changes in recent decades as the labor market opportunities of men and women have been converging. The second element that I want to think about are the socio-emotional skills of children. I think here it's um, not necessary to motivate why social-emotional skills are important, but we all know that they're a crucial um, dimension of human capital that are highly predictive of a lot of life outcomes that we care about, which is why we are also interested in find, finding out um, under, which uh, under which conditions um, um, we can actually foster the development of those skills and where they might not uh, uh, develop that well. So what um, do, does connect those two pieces? So the crucial element that I think connects those two elements are the monetary re and time resources um, of parents. So on the one hand, we know that those changes in the labor markets um, that we have seen, so the closing of labor market opportunities for men and women, have fundamentally altered the economic incentives for how parents allocate their money and their time to different um, activities such as, for example, their children. And on the other hand, we know that those monetary and time resources are crucial input factors for the development of skills of children. So what I, what I want to do in this paper is answering the following research questions. First of all, what is the impact of wage shocks that occur to parents on the socio-emotional skill development of the children? And especially, can we see whether, there, whether it depends to whom this wage shock actually occurs, whether there's a differential impact depending on whether the mother or the father is receiving this wage shock. And this is of course like a different, uh, it's taking like a sl slightly different angle at this question in comparison to the existing literature, because the existing literature oftentimes mostly focus on mothers as the one who's providing the time and monetary resources to its children. 
And then, of course, I also want to find out what are actually the mechanisms or the changes in the living environments that those children are facing through which uh, deformed relationships ca can be rationalized. And what I do in order to tackle those research questions is that I um, leverage the advantages of survey and, ad and administrative data sources from Germany to uh, combine a within family sibling comparison with a shift share approach to measure the wages that are available to mothers and fathers in the labor market. So just to make this very concrete, what I do is that I compare children who have exactly the same parents, who I observe at exactly the same chronological age, but in different calendar years. And the one thing that is going to be different across those calendar years are the wages that are available to their mothers and fathers in the labor market. So what are kind of like the identification challenges that, were, that I want to address with that? First of all, of course, there are unobserved uh, differences across families in terms of their preferences of how they want to raise their children, in terms of their genetic endowments and so forth. And these um, unobserved factors or confounders can be addressed uh, by comparing children who, I observe, who have the same parents and who I observe at the same age. So what are you doing about families that are divided? I mean, for example, single parent families versus kind of intact families. I only focus on intact families here. Only, oh, but there's yeah. a huge chunk, right? I mean, there's an issue even in Germany, right, about cohabitation, right? Um, there are no, so I basically, I, so intact families, I mean families um, who don't have to be married and I'll only look at the child, range, uh, child age range until the age of 10. Mm -hmm. And basically in this age range, I think uh, close to 90 92% of families in, uh, of, uh, in Germany are staying together with their children, or basically the two partners are staying together. So it's not as prevalent in terms of sig single home families as it might be in the US. The second um, identification challenge that I want to address are, of course, the endogenous labor market responses of families. So it could be the case that as soon as parents uh, observe something going wrong in the development of their children, that they withdraw from the labor market, that they might allocate to uh, occupations that are less time consuming, which of course would be reflected in the wages or could be reflected in the wages that they're making in the labor market. And in order to address this concern, I'm basically replacing the observed wages um, of those individuals with the potential wages that are constructed in the shift share design. So just to give you an in, uh, intuition of how this uh, shift share design looks like, I brought you here the examples of two labor market re regions in Germany. Um, those two labor market regions are similar to the extent that 25, 30 years ago in the year 1995, they have been characterized by a high share of female employment in the manufacturing sector. However, those two labor market regions were different in the particular type of manufacturing in which women were employed. So in the Black Forest region on the left-hand side, they were especially um, um, employed in the machinery and um, electronics um, uh, um, uh, sector, whereas in um, Franconia on the right-hand side, they were especially um, employed in the textile industry. Why is that of interest? Because if you look at the wage development in those two sectors at the national level, we see that there has been an overall stable and positive development of the wages paid in the electronics and machinery sector, whereas there has been by and large wage stagnation in the textile industry. So if you now combine those pieces of evidence, we would of course expect that um, the um, um, wages that are available to women, to women living in the uh, Black Forest region have seen um, uh, um, a much more positive development in terms of the wages that are available to them because they were able to partake in the overall positive wage development in the electronics and machinery sector, which is not the case for women living in the Franconia region. Education requirement for that industry? Sorry? Yeah. Education requirement. Um, at that time, probably the education is low, but very like That's a good question. I don't know. But I'm going to separate it out by education. So this is like a very coarse example to get, uh, give you an intuition about the mechanics. But what I actually do is that I construct potential wages for gender groups G at education level E, living in labor market region R at time period T. So basically, uh, there could be, of course, differential like uh, exposure to different industries depending on the education that you have. But this is exactly something that I will capture in the way that I construct the potential wages. But how segmented are these markets? I mean, looking at the map, what does it make you do? There'd be a lot of, even people could commute, right, from one region to the other. Yeah, yeah. So 90% or more than 90% of the people who are living actually exactly in this labor market region. So I can basically trace out, uh, so we have, uh, based on administrative data, I can identify whether people are um, uh, responding to be commuters or not. 
and more than 90% are actually, so it's very regional in Germany, especially in those regions here, which are kind of rural and people are not commuting a lot in order to get to their, to their occupation. That's a location, they would just relocate. No, but it's not just commute, but literally move. Yeah, yeah, that is something that I will take uh, care of by basically um, um, controlling for, uh, by actually observing um, to what extent but the parents um, are, are moving across the time period in which I observe the siblings. And again, we're talking about families with young children. They're basically staying where they are. Okay. So um, the, those potential wages, they co um, consist of uh, kind of like two elements. On the one hand, um, the employment share of a particular occupation times industry uh, uh, cell for this particular group in the base year 1995, which is interacted with the wage of, uh, at the national level of this particular occupation times industry uh, cell. So how do I use uh, those potential wages then in the research design? So what I'm interested in is an outcome Y of a child I, I at, uh, living in family F at age A in time period T. And um, I'm gonna uh, have a look at uh, what is the uh, differential impact basically of the potential wages that are available to their mothers and their fathers in the labor market. And those potential wages are, of course, constructed uh, by means of the shift share design. I also want to pay attention to um, um, potential differences, unobserved differences across families, which are, is why I in, uh, uh, introduce a vector of family times age fixed effects, such that I only compare siblings who I observe at the same chronological age, while also controlling um, um, for the vector of time fixed effects to account for any residual time trends um, um, across families. Now, what is the identifying assumption here? Basically, what I need is that the um, um, within family changes in the outcome of interest are um, um, uncorrelated to the historic employment compositions in the particular labor market region in which, um, or in the particular labor market in which the parents are active. And that is, of course, something that I um, try to apply, uh, kind of like test to the, uh, to the best extent possible in the paper and for which I provide a lot of robustness checks. Um, so what is the data that I use? So I use basically three data sources. On the one hand, there's the German socioeconomic panel, which is basically just the German piece ID. So what we have here is um, a household survey data with information on families, their time use, and of course, importantly, measures for child development. Um, the GSERP as such is too small to, co uh, to construct um, the potential wages that I need in a statistically reliable fashion which is why I bring in administrative data sources. So on the one hand, we have employer reported information on daily wages, plus um, the occupation in industries uh, in which um, um, employees are active. The, um, uh, and this data source has one big drawback, which is basically that I don't observe information on labor hours. And for that reason, I also bring in the third data source where I have information on industries, occupation, plus uh, working hours and combining those two data sources I basically have all the data inputs that I need in order to construct um, hourly potential wages um, for each uh, of the group that I'm interested in. So how does uh, my sample look like? Um, so basically in terms of the child characteristics, there are no big surprises. I have a gender balanced sample. I have um, uh, roughly 20% um, of the children that I observe are living in East Germany. And the age range, as I said, is in the age range between two and 12. And the average child, basically, in my sample is six years of, uh, seven years of age. When it comes to the time allocations of mothers and fathers, I think um, for those who are familiar with the German setting, there are also no big surprises. So we have basically um, that fathers are um, um, uh, uh, active in the labor market on average eight hours per day, while they only spend two and a half hours or, uh, with their children at home. This pattern completely reverses when we look at mothers. They're basically spending seven and a half hours at home with their children, while they only spend on average three hours per day in the labor market. So it's a very traditional role model assignment within families. And when it comes to kind of like the measures for child development, what I'm gonna look at are um, 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 measures for the socio-emotional skills of those children, namely the big five personality traits of those children plus also measures for externalizing and internalizing uh, behavior that are derived from the strength and difficulty questionnaire. Isn't there a well-developed child care system in Germany? Yep, so I mean, it is basically developing over time, um, um, also across the period of observation. 
However, it is mostly developing in the West. So like basically at the beginning of the period of observation here, most of the children that I'm looking at were actually cared for at home, at least in West Germany. In the former communist part, it was very developed, uh, the, the childcare system. Um, however, um, um, yeah, exactly. I mean, this is something that has been rolled out across the time period of observation, and we're still in the process of that, uh, rolling that out. So Germany is not like Scandinavia in terms of the child, uh, former child care system. But those two, oh, so your data is from all over Germany. It's not just those two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you will see in terms of where I find the effects, it speaks actually to this story. So the effects are especially going to be um, uh, clustered in the, in the West, where basically children had a higher propensity of being cared for at home. But I will get to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the internalizing behavior, what was that um, Like from where does this measure come from? Yeah, like what, what is actually happening? Um, so basically, it's basically, um, it's also derived from the strength and difficulty questionnaire, and it's basically measuring to what extent children are basically internalizing problems that they're facing by basically being withdrawn and um, um, introvert instead of externalizing behavior that is basically lashing out at other people, being hyper, uh, hyperactive and so forth. But in terms of like the, your initial condition, I don't know, like in terms of China, around that time period, like in the 1980s, it is like plan economy. So the wages we equalize across different industries. Mm -hmm. And uh, after, you know, it's changed to, you know, more capitalized market, and the wage inequality just uh, into sharpening. So I guess maybe the east part of Germany also will experience the same situation, right? So do you mean that like the wage increases in the east were much steeper than in the west? Because there's this convergence, or is the, the values of wages increase sharply, like because of yeah. Um, not sure, actually. So I think, like, I mean, we're starting in two thousand five, where actually most of the convergence has already happened. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure about the variance in uh, in terms of wages, whether it's much higher in the east as opposed to uh, to the west. But in the end, it, I mean, this is also not so important in view that I'm only making those intra household or kind of uh, sibling comparisons, right? Where I compare basically the same family and the changes in wages. But, okay, but it depends on like the severe age gaps. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But that is something that is something that I also can control for basically based on my observations. Yes? Is it common for, for like grandparents to take care of children? In yeah, Germany, you're, gonna see, you're gonna see that. So this is kind of like an illustration of the identifying variation that I have in my hand. So basically what you see here are changes in the um, gender wa wage gap or in potential wages segmented for different time periods by different education levels and of course also different labor market regions within Germany. And here you see kind of like those changes in terms of the gender wage gaps really go into, uh, into both directions. So we have um, the more brownish an area is the more are the gender gaps in terms of potential wages closing in this particular labor market in this particular region, whereas the more bluish an area is, the, the more is the gender wage gap widening, basically. So you have a lot of variation going in both directions. However, the average change that in my sample is, of course, consistent with the secular change in labor markets, um, which indicate basically is closing in gender gaps between men and women. Yes? That's interesting. There is a high wage gap decline during southern A and so the financial crisis. Okay, so just to illustrate why we could expect differential effects depending on what is happening to the whether the mother or the father is um, experiencing a wage shock. So what you see here is basically a reaction in terms of the time allocation of the mother if she experiences a one uh, a one euro increase in uh, in uh, potential wages. And what we see here is that she increases basically her the time that she spends in the labor market by 0 0.73 hours per day. And those, this additional time in the labor market is almost exclusively taken from, um, other, uh, from, from activities just as leisure or sleep, but it's not coming from the, uh, decreasing their time that they spend with their children. We see the same pattern actually when we, look, uh, when we look at fathers, but at a much more attenuated level. So basically here we see an increase in the time that they spend in the labor market if they experience a one, uh, one euro increase in their potential wages. And again, they take this time basically off the time that they use for other activities such as sleeping or um, uh, leisure activities. What we also see is that there's a cross, 
effect basically coming from wage increases that are experienced by the fathers. So what we see here is if the father increases, uh, has a, uh, experiences an increase in their potential wages by one euro, the mother is actually withdrawing from the labor market and using this time to spend again more time with the children. So in that sense, like if there's really a positive wage increase in cre uh, experienced by fathers, it tends to be the case that German families basically lapse back in a more traditional role model in terms of their time use. So what are the effects that we see in terms of uh, um, um, the impacts of those uh, wage shocks on the socio-emotional skills of children? We don't see anything in terms of the openness of the children. We don't see anything in terms of conscientiousness of the children. We don't see anything in terms of agreeableness, emotional stability, and internalizing behavior. And these effect sizes are estimated um, precisely enough also to exclude a number of effect sizes that have been um, um, established with respect to other quasi-experimental um, interventions. What we, however, see is that, uh, one, uh, that there are changes in terms of extraversion and externalizing behavior if there are wage shocks that are experienced by mothers. So if there's a one euro increase in the potential wages of mothers, there seems to be an increase of extraversion by 0.2 standard deviation and a, a corresponding increase in externalizing behavior by 0.26 standard deviation. Is, is that uniform across genders? <coughs> You are, you are asking exactly the right question. <laughs> so I will get to that in terms of the, um, um, uh, in terms of the heterogeneity analysis. So those are kind of like the baseline effects. Um, they're robust to a bunch of things that I won't be able to talk about today. However, the core question is, of course, like how, where do these effects actually arise? So what is happening here? And in order to kind of like uh, make this plausible, I first want to engage in the heterogeneity analysis. So first of all, one could be worried that those changes in the, in the or those wage shocks could a different, have a differential effect on, uh, on children with different uh, um, characteristics that makes them more susceptible to changes in the environment. However, when looking at differences by child sex and differences by child order, we don't see a lot of difference between, uh, based on those child characteristics. However, what we do see is that those effects are especially clustered in children that are below the age of six. Why is the, uh, the age below of six, uh, the age below of six um, uh, significant here? Because the age of six basically is the time when they are being, being sent off to elementary school. So this is the time when many German dis uh, families actually decide that they're going to take care of their child at home without exposing the child to many people outside of the, of the core household. What we also see is that those effects are especially clustered in the West. Why is the West significant? Because the West is basically this region in Germany where we don't have this uh, childcare infrastructure and where, where we basically have the case that many families actually decide to take uh, care of the children at home and don't expose them to many people outside of the household. And we also see that those incomes are especially clustered within high SES families. And again, this is again consistent with being those families that actually decide to not send their uh, children um, uh, to public uh, childcare, but to take, uh, to, to, to take care for, for them at home. So what this pattern is actually suggesting is that those changes in extraversion and also externalizing behavior that we observe when it comes to weight shocks, or as a reaction to the weight shocks that are experienced by mothers, are especially clustered within those children that high, have a, li a, high, a low probability of actually having a lot of interaction with people that are outside of the core household. How can we rationalize um, those patterns in terms of the different channels of time investments and monetary investments that I have been uh, alluding to at the beginning? So when I talk about time investments, I'm basically take, uh, talking about the amount of hours that the child is cared for at home, as opposed to um, being in non-parental care, which is either formal child care or informal child care. Informal child care is here basically uh, summarizing, going back to your question, um, extended family networks or paid in home babysitters. When we're talking about uh, monetary investments, we're talking about um, uh, proxies, um, uh, we're talking about proxy um, statistics like the total family earnings and the share of maternal earnings. Why the share of maternal earnings? It's basically linked to the, uh, to the, uh, um, to the hypothesis that mothers have a higher uh, propensity of actually spending their money to the benefit of their children as opposed to fathers. Didn't someone question the results with at the release, release time, like the, 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 the the 
husband and the wife, like right, it's more like it's somehow collaborate in terms of in terms of current generation, and they will spend more time like, with the kid compared with say like twenty or thirty years ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think in general, like there is a gender yeah, con consider about what's the German yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think in general there's convergence with respect to that, but in levels there's still massive differences in terms of what they're doing. Yeah. Was no, no question. Yeah. For example, like the the coefficient on wage of the father of parental care. Mm -hmm. So, can we interpret that as something like? the family is not substituting money investment for child investment and in like this like child care investment technology and so we see an increase in this like attributes of the kids like in the two specific categories that you should have heard. yeah so i will i will get to that uh, if you give me one minute um sorry so how can we rationalize basically those results in light, light of those investment mechanisms well, if you look at mothers, basically we have seen in terms of their time use that they're not substituting away from the time that they spend with their children. However, in the time that they spend in addition to the labor, uh, additionally in the labor market, they of course have to bring in also um, other care providers in the time that they're away. So we see kind of like this increase in um, the exposure to non-parent, uh, to, non uh, to informal child care providers. We also see that there's a massive uh, jump in terms of the total family earnings. So there are more financial resources available in the household, which is basically consistent with the fact that mothers are expanding their labor supply, fathers are not reacting appropriately, such that basically every additional euro earned by mothers is increasing the total financial resources within those families. So basically, based on that, we can see kind of like that those effects in terms of um, 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 extraversion, externalizing behavior, might be driven, especially by enough, like by the increased uh, exposure of, um, of children to other people who are not part of the core household, and perhaps um, also by those increases in uh, total family earnings. Now, why is there nothing for the father? Because here we see exactly, we see kind of like the reverse pattern. So what is happening if there's a wage increase for the father, the f uh, child is basically taking out of the care of people who are not uh, core part of the household, so we see decreases in the um, use of non-parental care arrangements and uh, um, um, or of, uh, yeah, formal and informal non-parental care arrangements, an increasing uh, time that the uh, child spends at home with the, with, the, uh, with, uh, with the parents. Now, when we're talking about parents here, this means basically the mother, right? Because the mother is withdrawing from the labor market. And we don't see any effects on the total, uh, total amount of resources that are available in those households, which again can be explained by the fact that the father is expanding the labor supply. The mother, however, is also withdrawing from the labor market. Exactly. So this is kind of like um, the last bit that I wanted to tell you. So what I do here in this paper is really to look at the differential impacts of um, wage shocks that occur to either mothers and fathers and the impact of these uh, shocks on the development of their uh, children in the socio-emotional domain. What I find is basically coming from the wage shocks of mothers increases in um, in extraversion and externalizing behavior, and those coefficients, I, uh, I don't, uh, didn't think uh, that I mentioned that, also are st statistically distinguishable from what is happening with the fathers, such that we can really uh, can conclude that there is here a differential impact depending on who is actually experiencing those, uh, this weight shock. And what we also see is that those effects are especially concentrated um, in those children who have a lower exposure to people outside of their household, which then also provides kind of like a channel for why we would actually uh, um, 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 uh, observe those movements in extraversion so the, uh, and in, in the externalizing behavior because uh, p uh, children are just more exposed to people outside of the household and therefore also react in their social interaction with those people. And with that being said, um, I think I'm coming to the end of today and I'm very grateful for your great comments and um, yeah, I also look forward to other discussions.